So now it seems to me, if I'm understanding this right, that this doing unto others as we would have them do unto us has something to do with us having this open door in heaven. We're actually going to use the S word today, sacrifice. <laughs> we act like it's almost a dirty word these days. Everybody always wants to know what they can get, not what they can give. To, self, to be self-centered means to be concerned solely or chiefly with one's own interests, welfare. To be engrossed in yourself, to be selfish, egotistical, independent, self-sufficient, and centered in yourself. Now, let me repeat what I said on Thursday night. When we talk about not being selfish, we don't mean that you're to never do anything for yourself. You need to do things for yourself. You won't be a healthy you if you don't. It's good to do things you enjoy. It's good to get some things for yourself that you really like. Uh, you work hard. You need to take care of yourself. It, it's good to laugh. It's good to rest. It's good to play. Please take care of yourself. In, invest in yourself. Invest in your health. But don't be totally absorbed with yourself, selfish and self-centered. So like I said, we always want to find the balance. Now we need to live a life where we're not trying to please ourselves, but we're trying to please God. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Maybe I should just ask if anybody here ever has a problem with being selfish. About two dozen people, well, I guess the rest of you are going to be kind of bored today then. <laughs> that you may walk, live, and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him and desiring to please him in all things. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking God to give you something you want, but if what you want or what I want is not what God wants, then we need to immediately let go of our plan and take hold of his. Even if it's uncomfortable, even if it hurts, even if it means sacrifice, it's a momentary sacrifice that will lead to much greater joy. Is there anyone here that God's really been dealing with you about letting go of something that means a lot to you, but you know God's telling you to let go of it and you just haven't gotten around to doing it yet? Okay, well then guess what? This is for you today. Can I just say that God won't change his mind? It's always nice for us to realize that he won't change his mind. No matter how long you put it off, it'll be the same. Bearing fruit in every good work and steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God with fuller, deeper, and clearer insight, acquaintance, and recognition. Fully pleasing to him and desiring to please him in all things. Now, I want to read you a little short story called How to Be Miserable. <laughs> Just in case anybody's, you know, wanting that, I can tell you how to get it. <laughs> Think about yourself constantly. Use I as often as possible. Mirror yourself continually by the opinion of other people. Listen greedily to what people say about you, and if it's not what you want to hear, get angry. Expect to be appreciated by everyone. Be suspicious. Be jealous and envious. Be sensitive and easily offended. Never forgive a criticism. Trust nobody but yourself. Insist on consideration and respect at all times. Demand agreement with your own views on everything. Sulk and feel sorry for yourself if people are not grateful to you for what you do for them. <laughs> Never forget how much you've done for other people. Think about it at all times. <laughs> but always remember what they have failed to do for you. <laughs> Shirk your duty. Seek at all times to entertain yourself and do as little as you possibly can for other people. Now, 
The thing that occurred to me while I was reading this, right in the middle of reading it, is this is exactly the way I used to be. I mean, there's probably not one of these things that I wouldn't have been guilty of when I started my journey with God 38 years ago. And I'm just here to tell you today that this is a very important issue. Jesus died so that we might no longer have to live to and for ourselves, but to and for him, Ephesians 5, 15. He died to forgive our sins. He died so we could go to heaven. He died so we could have a relationship with God. But he died so we would no longer have to live to and for ourselves. The greatest thing that God has set me free from is me. It is quite wonderful to not have to get up every day and do nothing but think about myself all day long. Self-centered people are self-deceived people. They think the more they do for themselves and the more everybody else does for them, the happier they will be. But the exact opposite is true. Luke 9, 23 through 25. And he said, if any person wills to come after me, let him deny himself, disown himself, forget, lose sight of himself and his own interests, refuse and give up himself. The simplicity of this is he's saying, if you really want to follow me, then you got to get yourself off your mind and take up your cross daily and follow me. The cross that Christ asked us to carry is not disasters and disease and every kind of misery that you can come up with. You know, sometimes when people are having trouble, they'll say, well, you know, it's just my cross to bear. Well, that's really not the cross that Jesus asked us to bear. Yes, we may have to go through things, but he came to give us victory over those things. The cross he's asking us to carry is to make a decision to live unselfishly in a world where people need to see Jesus. And Jesus is love. God is love. It's not just something he does. It's who he is. He pours his love into us so we can receive it, be healed, and then let that love pour out of us to other people. God works through people. We keep asking God to do this and God do that and God solve this problem and God solve that problem. I wonder what would happen if we'd begin to pray, God, I want to pray for this person that's hurting and if you want to use me, show me what you want me to do. Actually, I'm going to challenge you today to begin to pray just like that because you'll be amazed if you stop just praying for God to help people. That don't cost anything. I can even feel quite religious when I do that. But if I really get down to business and say, now God, I don't, you know, I don't know if there's anything you'd want me to do or not, but if you do, show me what it is and give me the grace to do it. And sometimes we look at a problem and we don't even consider that God might use us because the problem is too big for us all by ourselves. But you know, there's nothing wrong with going around and getting a few other bored, miserable Christians. to get on board and help you. I'm telling you, we come alive when there's a need and we start trying to meet it. The Holy Spirit puts many opportunities in front of us to put others before ourselves if we just will. Let me give you an example. This just happened about three weeks ago. Dave and I took a little trip to Branson, Missouri to just rest and see some of the shows down there and we went to one show that really just was pretty cheesy and wasn't very good at all. And uh, so I'm already got my plan after about 30 minutes, break time, I'm leaving. <laughs> and um, so I said to Dave, I said, this is really bad. Let's just, we need to go at the break. And he said, you know, I've been kind of thinking about that too. And he said, I don't feel like God wants us to leave. And I'm, I kind of like already knew that, but <laughs> I wasn't quite 
paying all the attention to God that I needed to. Because, you know, sometimes when you really want to do something, you can just kind of brush God off pretty quick. And uh, so, of course, you know, I got a little, well, why do we need to stay? And he said, well, just, he said, I just thought about it. And he said, you know, if that was you and people left, he said, you know how you feel if somebody gets up and leaves while you're preaching. And he said, just, I just think it would make them feel bad. And so he said, I just think we should stay. So I knew right away it was right. You know, there's a little thing in the Bible that says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I started trying to live according to that, and I made a couple hours. <laughs> then the next day, I'd have to start again, and then the next day, I would have to start again. And God keeps bringing that scripture back to me, and I think we're in for a fight. Because I don't think we really even begin to comprehend how much it would change our lives if we actually did that. Do you know there would be no problems in marriages if people did that? Let's look at Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking reverently and the door will be opened. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds, and to him who keeps on knocking, the door will be opened. So we see that God is inviting us to bring our needs to him and to, to even be a reverent pest at times. Now what man is there of you if his son asks him for a loaf of bread will hand him instead a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will hand him a serpent? If you then, evil as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven, perfect as he is, give good and advantageous things to those who keep on asking him? So this invitation is clear. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. God is good. He wants to help you. If you ask him for something, he's not going to give you something bad. If you can be a blessing to your children, evil as you are, how much more will God bless his children? Amen? Did I say that wrong? I don't know. What did I say? You're laughing, and I didn't think I said anything funny. <laughs> anyway, evil as we are, if we can give good things to our kids, then God can do so much more. But now here's the part I want you to see, verse 12. So then. Now, so then wouldn't be there if what we're getting ready to read didn't have a lot to do with what we just read. So then, whatever you desire that others would do to and for you, even so do also to and for them. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So now it seems to me, if I'm understanding this right, that this doing unto others as we would have them do unto us has something to do with us having this open door in heaven. And see, we would prefer to think that we can just mistreat people and act any way we want to, and then when we have a need, go ask God to meet that need and expect Him to do it. And the Bible teaches us very plainly that God, if, if we're angry and we refuse to forgive people that have hurt us, then God can't even forgive us and answer our prayers. And I don't think we even begin to comprehend how many angry Christians there are. I mean, it's like an epidemic. I have never taught in any kind of a meeting on anything about unforgiveness, anger, strife, bitterness, and ask at the end, how many of you need prayer in this area? I am not exaggerating. I have never had one meeting ever and done that where I didn't have at least 70%, 70% of the whole crowd on their feet. And I'm going to be honest, it concerns me. Because there's so much to be done in this hour that we're living in. And God needs us fully loaded. Amen? Amen? We need to be fully loaded, full of the power of God, and not living these little selfish, self-centered, demanding lives where we just have ourselves on our mind all the time. And you know what? You may not be like this at all, and I hope and pray that you're not, 
But boy, I sure was at one time. And if you don't need this message today, I'll just preach to myself because I still need a little refresher course just every now and then. Amen? So if nothing else, this is just insurance today to help us stay on the right track. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. God is good, and he wants to bless you. So then, <laughs> whatever you would that other people would do for you, start doing that for them before they're doing it for you. We can't wait to do what's right after somebody else treats us right. The more mature person is the one who goes first. <laughs> Amen? You might have to treat somebody else right a long time before you get a right result. But even if you don't ever get a right result from them, you will get a reward from God. Did you hear me? Let me say it again. You might have to treat somebody else right for a long time before you start getting a right result. And even if they never do what you want them to do, don't feel like your efforts have been wasted because you have a reward coming from God. God promises us that we will reap according to what we have sown. And when he comes back, his reward and his wages will be with him. Verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and spacious and broad is the way that leads away to destruction, and many are those who are entering through it. But the gate is narrow, contracted by pressure, and the way is straightened and compressed that leads away to life, and few are those who find it. Now, I'll be honest, it was a little bit hard on my flesh to just keep sitting in that show, even though I knew it was the right thing to do, even though I wanted to be obedient to God and had decided to be. I couldn't wait for it to get over. You know, just because we obey God, that doesn't mean our flesh is going to be clapping and having happy goosebumps. I mean, this is where, to be honest, to me, suffering for Christ comes in. And that's not a word that we like to use much in the church. People don't seem to like you much if you talk much about suffering. And, you know, there's, there's certainly a certain kind of suffering that Jesus paid for that we don't have to endure. But the Bible says that if we're not willing to suffer in the flesh as Christ suffered, then we can never really walk in the Spirit and be obedient to God. We have to be willing to sacrifice what we want many times because we know it's not the best thing for the kingdom of God or for somebody else. Now, I could have walked out of there and probably would have if Dave wouldn't have been listening a little more than me. Sometimes I listen better than him. Sometimes he listens better than me. That's why we make a good team. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll be ready to just really give somebody what they deserve. And Dave will say, well, I think we need to show him mercy. And then other times he, he'll be like, you know, man, that guy needs to get off the road. He can't, can't even drive at all. I'm like, well, now don't act like that. You know, he probably just didn't see you. And so it's good to have other people around sometimes that can remind us if we start to get off track just a little bit. Amen? But now here's what happens to us, I believe, a lot of times. Let's just say that maybe I would have went ahead and got up and left. And you know what? If I would have gotten up and left, I would have known in my heart that it wasn't probably the most excellent thing to do. I would have known that. I wonder how many dozens of times, daily or weekly, that we feel that and we override that feeling and go on and just do what we feel like doing. I'll give you an example in church services. How many of you know it's really not the coolest thing in the world to come into a service late? and interrupt a bunch of other people that are trying to worship God. How many of you know it's really not... I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that anybody during an altar call when people are being talked to about their salvation, I find it hard to believe that anybody can be really comfortable getting up, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, And you 
you know what? Yes, these are little things, but are they really little things? It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. And I think if we can learn to be obedient in these little things, then we're not going to really have a difficult time being obedient in the bigger things. A lot of these things are things that are just between us and God. They're not even anything that you go talk to anybody else about. It's just you just kind of know that God wants you to do this or doesn't want you to do that. And then just because you love him and you want to please him, you go do it. And if you're uncomfortable, then so what? You're uncomfortable. You still have a great feeling inside. So here's what would have happened had I left, kind of sensing it wasn't right. In all probability, that day, maybe into the next, I would have kind of just felt like I'm not quite as happy as normal, like, I don't know what's wrong. I wonder how many times we go around thinking, I don't know what's wrong. I'm just kind of in a little funky mood today, and I don't know, you know, I don't know what's causing it. And then even worse, sometimes we look around and start blaming it on somebody else. Well, you're not this, and you're not that, and you're not something else. And it's amazing what happens if we'll get honest and start saying to God, what, what's going on here? You know, and literally, I believe that I could have poisoned my own happiness through something as simple as not treating that person the way I would have wanted to have been treated. You all think that I'm okay, or are you just like, no, nah, that's too much for me? So I didn't plan this until this morning, but I thought I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about sowing and reaping. The Bible says, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. And there's, let's see, one, two, three, four. I have five quick scriptures here about sowing and reaping. So let me just say first, before I say this, that it's a pretty amazing thing. This sowing and reaping thing gives us a lot of power. And to be honest, if I can get something by sowing it into somebody else's life, then that gives me a certain amount of control over my destiny. In other words, if I want people to be friendly with me, all I got to do is start being friendly. The Bible says if, if I want God to forgive me, all I need to do is forgive everybody else who mistreats me. If I want mercy when I make mistakes, then all I have to do to get that mercy is just be a merciful person who gives other people mercy. Now, I don't know about you, but I like control and power. And so this seed sowing thing excites me because that means, oh, if I want people to like me more, all I need to do is start being nicer to them. Hello? It's really, it's really amazing, this whole thing, this privilege that God has given us. Matthew chapter 7, the first two verses, do not judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourselves. For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged and criticized and condemned. And in accordance with the measure you use to deal out to others, it will be dealt out again to you. That can't be much plainer, can it? How many of you don't want other people picking on you for all your faults? How many of you would love other people just to cover some of your mistakes and just zip their lip about it and not say anything. Well, guess what? The best way to get that is to start giving it. Uh-oh. Well, I might as well just unload both barrels. I'm leaving town. I'll be back next August, and you will have forgiven me by then. Conditions of what we saw here just absolutely broke Shelly and Mai's heart. There was no water. People would have to walk for hours and hours one way to get dirty water. There was no education. 
And so we started planning and, and asking how can we make a difference in this. And so today we're here and we have just dedicated one of five wells that we've dug in this area. And these are not just wells, they're solar paneled with pumps and they have reservoirs of 10,000 liters and they will just change this whole community. And we've dedicated a primary school that will, will do grades one, two, three, four, five. So we've literally changed this entire community uh, here in Tanzania. And we just couldn't do it without you. So we're so grateful. The people are so appreciative. And we say thank you and God bless you. Ik was echt afhankelijk en was me daar niet van bewust. Ik wist niet eens dat ik zo op zoek was naar goedkeuring. En toch heb ik op de een of andere manier mijn leven lang geprobeerd het anderen naar hun zin te maken. Het lukte me maar niet om de persoon te zijn die anderen wilden dat ik was. En ik heb me altijd druk gemaakt over wat anderen van me denken. Ik snakte naar goedkeuring en ik geloof dat ik dat nog regelmatig doe. Ik geloof niet dat ik ooit echt mezelf was. Maar nu is het anders. In haar nieuwe boek Verslaafd aan Goedkeuring laat Joyce Meyer uitgebreid zien hoe jij je zelfbeeld kunt veranderen. Leer jezelf beter kennen en leer te accepteren hoe jij bent als persoon. Bestel nu Verslaafd aan Goedkeuring telefonisch op 026 20 22 100 of bezoek onze website joyce-meyer.nl.